It's a great pleasure to be here. I was really honored when Manira asked me to, to talk here. Because um, I, I, I would, you know, when I look at the heavy hitters who you had it speaking for you, to you before, these are, you know, people on the cutting edge. People are doing research on the new directions and, and towards treatments in myeloma. And of course, my background is more rooted in the now. What are the treatments we have right now that we're using that are the mainstay treatments that really make a difference to people's lives right now? It's it's very interesting to know about what the future may hold. But it's vital when you're going through this process and you want to get a treatment that you know uh, really everything there is to know about what the current treatment is and what you can expect from it and what you can achieve uh, by going through this treatment. And I'm amazed always <clears throat> at the number of people who actually come in all trusting onto my ward ready to get high dose chemotherapy. And they'll walk in and they'll say, so um, uh, what exactly is myeloma? And, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, I mean, and I realize that we have a really busy healthcare system and, and people have, you know, rushing through clinics where there's 60 people booked and sometimes they've got five, 10 minutes with their doctor and they don't know what questions to ask and the doctor well meaningly explains everything and, and assumes that it's all been absorbed and often it, it just doesn't. And uh, I always try to remedy that when I see patients who have questions and I've got all the time to spend with them when they're in patients and try to really go over things. And, and when you do that, um, even you know, topics that people thought were scary become less intimidating. As I always say, the more you know about it, the less intimidating it is, because then you know where you're at. You can, you can achieve a degree of control over this disease when you know your enemy, you know what it is, you know what to expect from it, and you know what to expect from the treatments and what you can gain from these treatments. And you know that the treatments are doable. It's not like, oh gosh, here's this scary thing that might kill me. It's like, oh, this is a doable treatment. Sure, it's got some crumminess to it, but this is the benefit I'm gonna get from it. And it's not propaganda, it's not a what if, it's like, yeah, this is, this is, this is what's gonna happen. And so I'm gonna try to demystify myeloma. I mean, this is a very well-informed group, so I'm, I'm worried that what I say might just all be old hat to you. Um, but I really think that when understanding autotransplant, you really also got to understand myeloma itself. Because when you know what myeloma is, how it works, where it is, then you know why this treatment makes sense and, and what you could achieve from it. So just a little bit of background, as, as uh, Manira already said. Oh, no, this isn't working. Uh, Oh, now it, yeah, now it is working. Okay, just a little bit of background on where I work. I mean, most of you are very familiar with, with Princess Margaret. Um, but the old Princess Margaret, the Ontario Cancer Institute slash Princess Margaret Hospital started in the 1950s in Wellesley. And that, uh, they started up the allogeneic bone marrow transplant program, you know, where there's a donor and a receiver, which has nothing to do with you guys or what anybody would, uh, with myeloma would, would, would get. But, uh, Princess Margaret was the go-to place for cancer treatment uh, of that nature, uh, whereas over at Toronto General, we started their, Armand Keating started the autologous bone marrow transplant program in 1986. And that's the first autologous transplant program in Toronto. And then these two institutions merged in 1995, moved to the current site with this architecturally challenged structure. And I always think like this part here is about to blast off into outer space, but that's, that's our home uh, since 1995. And <clears throat> in 2012, it was renamed because this Ontario Cancer Institute slash Princess Margaret Hospital is pretty much of a mouthful and confusing. So it's now under the unified name of Princess Margaret Cancer Center, which includes, of course, both research and clinical care. Um, so that's where I work. And why this talk, I've already kind of mentioned that, uh, you know, we really want to understand what the current treatment is. And this is an important treatment because it's been a standard of care. It's not new, it's old. It's been the standard of care since 1996. So it's almost 20, coming up on 20 years of this being the standard go-to treatment for multiple myeloma. Uh, over 90% of the people with myeloma who referred to Princess Margaret will get at least one autotransplant. Um, and for now, it's still the single most effective intervention for extending quality life. So, I mean, all the treatments work together, and you want the treatments before and the treatments afterwards. But as far as the whole thing is concerned, this one component is, is still the single most effective one for giving you more bang for your buck. <clears throat> so this is the analogy I like to tell people. Anyone of my demographic hopefully recognizes this. It was my favorite toys when I was a kid. It was the old Hot Wheels. 
Um, and I don't know if you remember that the Hot Wheels has this little structure here, which was the coolest thing when you were six years old. This is the supercharger. Uh, and the supercharger was really a, a, a handy thing because it would make your, make your Hot Wheels go. As you can see here, you put in your Hot Wheels and boom. <clears throat> and it, the hot, it's starting to slow down, goes through that thing, and boom, it's giving the energy for another go round, right? So this could be considered the, the road of life. And here you have Princess Margaret or any other cancer center. Uh, and people are coming in there, getting their auto transplant, and that gives them a boost. That puts their disease under control, gives them another lap on the track of life. So that's what we're, we're doing here, really, is the auto transplant is your supercharger in life, give you another, another lap. Okay. So we're going to go over what is myeloma. I like to go over that in detail, even though people say, oh, I already know all this stuff. But uh, it's amazing to me how many people still come in. They, just don't have the details. And so I want to review myeloma and give a bit of the historical background of how and how long it took for medical science to really understand myeloma. Um, and, a bit of, and that leads directly into the history of autotransplants, of stem cell transplantation and autotransplant specifically. What's involved in autotransplant, most of you know, or a lot of you know, how many people here just have, have had an autotransplant? So, yeah, so that's a lot of people, but this will just be like, you know, stuff you've already experienced. Uh, and the others will have an understanding of what is either lies ahead of them or what their family member's going through. Uh, so, uh, and then a little, just briefly at the end, where do we go from here with after autotransplant? So this stuff, it's amazing how many people come to me and they still say, oh yeah, I, you know, ever since I've had this melanoma. And I'm going, no, 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 you don't have melanoma. You know, you have multiple myeloma. And there are, or people know what myeloma is, but every time they try to explain it to somebody, they think it's melanoma, which is an entirely different disease. So, and the name's kind of weird. It doesn't, initially, it doesn't seem very intuitive, but it's in fact a perfect name. Uh, so Milo is from the Greek meaning marrow, oma, a growth. So multiple myeloma is literally multiple growths in the marrow. So it's a very descriptive term, which, uh, and it it's, it's makes perfect sense. Yeah, there's multiple areas in the marrow which have this disease. It's my, multiple myeloma. And bone anatomy, again, most people think of bones as being an inert skeletal framework or on your, which you're... Which, uh, which supports your body, but it's very much a living organ, right? And, and we all know now that your marrow is in the bone, and the marrow is the factory that makes your blood cells. So there's these all-important blood stem cells that live in your marrow that give rise to your red cells and your white cells and your platelets that go into your blood. So this factory is in the, in the bone marrow and normally doing its good job for us, and it's well served by blood vessels. So blood goes in and out of the bones. <clears throat> so, if you consider the area above the dotted blue line there, that's, that's what goes on in the marrow. And then these are the mature cells that are circulating in your blood. And this, again, is that all-important blood stem cell. So the, the parents and the grandparents uh, and the great-granddaddy or great-grandmother, they, they live in, the, in your bone marrow, um, whereas the other cells uh, stopped working, but hmm. let's see. Try that again. Anyway, so these other cells here that live in your blood, um, they, uh, they are the progeny of these master cells that give rise to them. Um, so is this going to work? Oh, yeah. So I want to draw your attention, of course, to the B lymphocyte. So of the white blood cells, <clears throat> the B lymphocyte is the one that's going to turn into the plasma cell, the plasma cell, which is the all-important cell, of course, in multiple myeloma. So the B lymphocytes come out of your marrow, go into your blood, and they travel to your lymph nodes. So in the lymph node, uh, which is, you know, you're peppered with lymph nodes that are the main guard stations where the, your body has to fight, your, the immune system has to fight uh, invading pathogens. So if you're exposed to viruses or bacteria, little bits of them are delivered to the B cells in your lymph nodes. And when they encounter the, um, the uh, when they encounter the, uh, the, uh, the pathogen, they are stimulated to differentiate, to evolve into plasma cells. And at the same time, what they do is they go back to the bone marrow, and there they divide and make your mature plasma cells. So the, they, the prodigal son returns uh, in a new form. You now have plasma cells. They live in your marrow. They make the antibodies, which are these little Y-shaped proteins, these little Y-shaped proteins that can bind onto uh, invading pathogens and, and help your immune system get rid of them. 
So we all know, generally as lay people, we know the concept of antibodies. We know that antibodies fight bad guys. And we know that now that plasma cells, which uh, were formed from the B cells, live in your bone marrow and make these antibodies. And you need to know that kind of thing to understand myeloma. And this is a really scary looking uh, busy slide, but it's just to show that, um, you know, here this tube and this tube on the other side, they both in, are representing your bone marrow. And again, shows just what we said. The B cell leaves the bone marrow, travels to, this represents the lymph node. Uh, so in the lymph node, they encounter these little germs and they develop an army of, of activated B cells which travel back to the bone marrow, become plasma cells and make these little antibodies, right? So it's the same thing shown again on this slide. So the, it's, a, it's a miracle, really, that our bodies are built this way. Wow, our blood is made in our bone marrow. These B cells go to the lymph nodes, they encounter germs, they travel back to the bone marrow, they turn back into plasma cells, and they make all these antibodies. That's incredible. It is incredible. Uh, occasionally, like everything in life in complex structures, things might go wrong. And so if you have some mutations anywhere along that pathway, then you get an abnormal plasma cell. And so this is what happens in myeloma. That there again is the bone and the bone marrow. And in that bone marrow, we have normal plasma cells that are making normal antibodies. But if there's been enough mutation to cause myeloma, then we got a clone, an army of these mindless uh, abnormal uh, plasma cells. And they make copies of themselves and they make uh, these abnormal antibodies, these abnormal molecules. So, and, and unfortunately, these start to outnumber the good ones and the, the abnormal uh, protein or monoclonal protein, as you often know about it. Uh, they start to outnumber the normal antibodies. So that's myeloma. So we know all that now, but it, it took a long time to get all that knowledge, <clears throat> like over 100 years, really. Um, and then it also helps to know about the structure of the antibody because patients and patients' family members often hear their doctors talk about uh, IgG lambda or IgG kappa or IgA lambda or IgA kappa. And they say, well, what is that? Well, that's just, just all that is is describing the type of antibody, of abnormal antibody that's being produced by these plasma cells. So this is that Y-shaped molecule, it's a type of protein, and this little, the little bits, those are called the light chains, and those light chains come in two varieties, uh, kappa or lambda. So when people hear that, oh yeah, I've got IgG kappa myeloma, that means that their plasma cell's producing an IgG molecule, and it's got the, the kappa or the lambda a light chain associated with it. So these other antibodies also exist. IgG is by far the most common myeloma, but some people have IgA. Um, and we used to think that there was some prognostic significance to the type, but there isn't really so much. We now know that that's another thing. That's on the genetics, not so much on the antibody type. So, uh, so now we know myeloma, and we learned it all in what, 10 minutes, what we just talked about here. It took over 100 years for medical science to figure this out. So it's no surprise that patients come in to me and they say, well, what is myeloma? Because they've had a five minute talk on it, on a topic that took over, uh, literally over 100 years to, to clarify. And you have to go back to 1844 to see the first published description of myeloma, which at that time was called Molites osseum, softening of the bones. Uh, and then in 1845 was Dr. Ben Jones des describing the protein in the urine that to this day bears his name. So the protein that's in the urine, the Ben Jones protein it's called, or BJ protein sometimes for short. That's just in honor of Dr. Ben Jones who, who, who described it back then. And the first appearance of the term multiple myelomas in 1889, it was called Collar's disease because Dr. Collar was the guy who described, came up with that name, myeloma. So, um, 1895, you see the first accurate description of a plasma cell. So, so see, because the knowledge is building gradually. Okay, there's softening of the bones, there's abnormal protein. Oh, look at, there's these abnormal cells, these plasma cells. In 1928, they discover, oh, hey, that abnormal protein's also in the blood. So we got abnormal, we got abnormal cells in the marrow, we got abnormal protein in the blood, abnormal protein in the urine. It's all kind of pictures emerging. It's taken a heck of a long time to figure this out. 1956, Dr. Korngold and his, uh, his, his chief technologist, Lepari, they discovered those two different classes of protein. Uh, so the kappa and lambda that we were talking about, that's how that name comes about. Korngold begins with K, like the Greek letter kappa. Uh, Lepari, L, like the Greek letter lambda. So this kappa and lambda designation is honoring these guys from 1956. So that's like 112 years to, to develop the knowledge that we just imparted 
in five minutes. <clears throat> so uh, it's, it's a lot of stuff, but it's not easy stuff to figure out uh, for, for medical science. So that leads directly into the concept of, well, okay, that's what myeloma is. How about some kind of effective treatment for, for myeloma? Um, and right around the same time that they're really getting a handle on what myeloma is in the 50s, by happenstance, that's when you also see melphalan being developed. So melphalan, which we take for granted now as a mainstay in, uh, in cancer treatment, is an old drug, really old. <clears throat> so, um, and in fact, it started post-war research, you know, altering molecules like mustard gas and for World War I, you know, weapons of, nasty weapons of, of mass destruction, uh, chemical weaponry. Uh, so the idea is, well, hey, you know, it works against people, maybe it'll also work against cancer. So if you alter it and alter the molecule and harness its power for good, yeah, we got, we got toxins that can kill myeloma. And, and Dr. Blockin in, in 1958 was the first one to say, yeah, this works for melphalan, and melphalan seems to work in myeloma. Now, we have to mention another PMH connection. Dr. Ber Daniel Berksagel, the late Dr. Berksagel, he was quite famous for his pioneering work with melphalan for myeloma. So that's at Princess Margaret uh, back in the late 50s through to the 60s. Um, so there's a problem, though. So they got, a, now we understand the disease, now we've got a drug. Uh, this drug seems to work for the disease, but <clears throat> it just worked for a little while. It seemed to help with symptoms, it helped make that protein go down, but people weren't living any longer when they started crunching numbers and looking, eh, but they're not living any longer. So what do we, up the dose, up the dose. Well, the problem is in the up the dose of a toxin, it just becomes more toxic. So yeah, sure, it seems to help bore for the myeloma, but it, it ain't helping the patient if you kill them. So, and this is the problem with conventional dose chemotherapy. So this represents here, uh, these are cells. Imagine these are cells in your marrow. Imagine that the yellow, super arbitrarily, the yellow cells, let's say, are the good cells and the, the brown cells here are the myeloma cells. So what are we dropping? With conventional dose chemotherapy, we're dropping a little bomb on these cells, a nonspecific bomb. So we just go, okay, boom, boom, <laughs> little bomb, <laughs> okay. And it kills some cells, eh, great. And, but then, and then your new cells fill in the space, so your counts go down, your counts recover from the bomb, but it's left a couple, it's left a few. So it's helped, it suppressed the disease, but it wasn't enough. So people say, well, well, let's give them a bigger dose. Let's give them high-dose chemotherapy. But there's a problem with that, because here's the same scenario, and you drop the bigger bomb. This is, I guess this is as loud as I get, but that's a big bomb. So, so you drop the big bomb, it wipes out everything, good and bad. We go, yeah, got rid of those myeloma cells. Uh, oh, but blood cell counts aren't recovering. That's no good. <clears throat> okay, pull back. We can't give that kind of dose of melphalan. It's not safe. But already in the 50s, people were already, look, already had the vision to say, but if we could get around that, if we could give people blood stem cells after we've given them high-dose chemotherapy, then that'll do this. Slide them in. They'll divide. They'll fill in the rest. Their blood counts will recover. So the vision was already there in the 50s. The imagination of medical science was there. The technology wasn't. But people had an idea going forward. We, got it, we understand this disease. We got a drug that works for it. In high doses, it's too toxic. But hey, if we can do this, we can give them high dose chemotherapy. So that's where another PMH connection comes in. Uh, and these are very famous people, Dr. Till and Dr. McCullough. Um, and starting at the old PMH, uh, they were scientists in the Ontario Cancer Institute and researchers at University of Toronto. So they were PMH doctors. This is them then. and. Uh, and then uh, more in the 21st century at the modern PMH. So they're credited with being the first discoverers of hematopoietic stem cells, which is the fancy way of saying blood-forming stem cells. These are the cells you need. You need to get those cells, you need to collect them, you need to have them adequately uh, stored so that you can then do the treatment with high-dose chemotherapy. So from 1961, people are going, yeah, we got one piece of the puzzle. <clears throat> What also had to ensue over several decades was reliable methods for collecting these cells and for uh, making sure you got enough of them and storing them, cryopreserving them, storing them in cold uh, freezers that, so that you can use them on the, on the, when you actually need to use them. <clears throat> so you see the, all these pieces falling into place. So um, 1970s, so we're, we've gone from 1844 now up to 1970, we finally see the first autologous bone marrow transplants. Not for myeloma at that time, 
they were being done at that time for lymphoma and some other things. It was investigational, just the concept, showing that you can do this. You can give people whack and big doses of chemotherapy, and then you can rescue their marrow by giving them these stem cells back. So the first reports for myeloma were in 1983. So 83, there was an investigational treatment, but it was looking promising. Okay, we got a treatment. We can give high-dose chemotherapy, high-dose melphalan specifically. Uh, we can give them bone marrow back, and it'll recover, make their, their cell counts recover. So from 1983 to 1996, this is interesting because it gives you the idea of how long it takes to go from an effective treatment to knowing and proving it's an effective treatment, and that this is something that's going to be now made available to everybody. That's 13 years. So when you think of like new drugs that have been forming, and like you know, you hear a story in the news. Oh, here's a promising thing, and people come in and they bring the news story and they say, "Here's a new drug, doc. What do you think? Is that going to be good? Might be good. 13 years from now, we'll know. Uh, it's going to take a while. So and and it could be for all of those drugs. It could be that most of those don't pan out, and one does. Uh, so this is not too surprising that it, uh, in fact, it's not too bad because it's a, the disease, as you all know, 40 per million per year. You've got to collect enough people. You've got to randomly assign them to the treatment or conventional treatment, follow them along for years, try to parse the numbers and see, who, see if it works. Um, and mentioned it doesn't always work out. So if you look in 1998, uh, 1998, this is uh, International Bone Marrow Transplant Registry. This is a program that collects data from around the world. Everybody's does that, so they go in there and they crunch the numbers, and they look at things. And this shows you in yellow what were, what were the, the indications for autologous stem cell transplant in 1998. By far and away, most auto transplants were being done for breast cancer. And if, you know, anyone who walks through the hospital now knows that nobody with breast cancer gets high-dose chemotherapy in a stem cell transplant. By far and away, most were being done for breast cancer. Why? because it looked promising, and breast cancer is a heck of a lot more common than myeloma, and there's huge pressures to, to do something. And people jumped on that bandwagon before any clinical trials were completed. Um, and in the meantime, we did it too at Princess Margaret, but we did them, people were enrolled in randomized controlled trials. And when the data came out, it showed, oh, it doesn't work. So five years later, it's gone from the, the table. Um, so that's, that's the, the dilemma if you embrace uh, a treatment too soon. You might cause a lot of toxicity for no benefit, and it finally gets shown years later. So we try to avoid that. So for myeloma, it standed the test of time. Clinical trials showed it worked. And if you see here in 2003, if you compare it to the previous slide, 1998, remember in 1996 it became standard of care? In 1998, uh, whereas myeloma is here, so a little over 2,000 reported to the International Bone Marrow Transplant Registry. Five years later, everyone's geared up their programs, uh, and you see over 4,000 being done in 2003. So it really started to take off once it became proven that it was a benefit. This is a cool graph. I mean, graphs are boring generally, right? Graphs are like math class and I'm not interested in them. But, but it, 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 this shows that same phenomenon. Here, see back in 1980, you see, you see people realizing, okay, we've got a technique. It's investigational. So people start doing, this is both allogeneic transplant, that scary treatment, which we don't recommend to anybody with, that, with myeloma, and autologous stem cell transplant. And you see initially people are trying them on different, different diagnoses, and the number of transplants increases. And then you start getting evidence that proves it works. And so it starts to take off. So in the 90s, you see proof that it's working for lymphoma, it's working for Hodgkin's disease, it's working for myeloma, and it really spikes here but it spikes way over spikes because of the breast cancer phenomenon. So you see that in, in the late um, 90s, you see this huge peak. Uh, part of this big rush is because of more lymphoma and myeloma patients being treated appropriately, but then over spikes because of the breast cancer patients. And when people realize, oh, that doesn't work, it comes back down to the tried and true indications, Hodgkin's, not Hodgkin's, myeloma. And it's been more or less stable for the last 15 years because it's, it's a good treatment, it works, and there's nothing better. There's ways of improving upon it with the drugs that come before and after, but it is the standard of care, and it's not going away until something really spectacular comes along. <clears throat> so uh, most of the time here, as of the history, we're talking about bone marrow. Uh, nowadays, of course, we don't tend to use bone marrow. We use peripherally collected stem cells. So the same kind of cells, but collecting them from a different place. So it used to be 
you had, to, you had to do a bone marrow harvest. And they still do these somewhere, but we're really getting away. We don't do it in auto anymore. And in the aloe world, they still do it depending on where the donor is and where they're coming from. But, um, you know, a person gets a general anesthetic. Uh, they're, you know, lying on their tummy. It's like getting multiple bone marrow biopsies. It's bruising. It's you know, the anesthetic. They're sore afterwards. They often have to be transfused. Um, and then there's the laborious technology of figuring out uh, how, if you have enough cells afterwards, too. In the old days, it was done by culturing and counting how many colonies were formed and, and so on. Um, so that is supplanted by peripherally collected stem cells. And the uh, advantages are, are multiple, but um, you know, now people, this is, this is Pam, our chief, chief uh, uh, charge nurse uh, in the apheresis unit. Some of you may have met her. And these are the, the newer apheresis machines. Uh, this is actually from the UK. I couldn't find a picture from us, but same idea, same machine. So people sit in a comfy chair and they're hooked up to the machine and their blood goes through there, which separates out the fraction that contains the stem cells. And this apheresis method is far less arduous for the patient. Um, and it produces a better quality product too. <clears throat> so uh, when, when we collect these cells, uh, often you've heard uh, the, of these so-called CD34 cells because these early cells, early blood cells that live in the marrow, um, express this protein on them called the CD34 marker. And in the lab, we measure how many of those we have to make sure we've got enough cells to do a transplant. Now you'll notice, this is a little finer point that we don't, I don't really tell anybody other than residents. I don't usually tell my patients because it gets, it's more than they want to know. But just in case you're interested, the actual stem cell, the ones that you really want, they actually don't have much CD34 on them. Uh, these guys here, which are a little bit downstream, these are not cells that actually make copies of themselves, but they show the CD34 count. So when we collect CD34 cells, we're actually collecting kind of the wrong cells. Um, but it doesn't matter because we know that these guys hang out with these guys. So we know from decades of experience, if we collect enough cells with that CD34 marker, then for sure you got enough of these guys lurking in the background, we got enough cells to do a transplant. So often people come in and say, oh, they told me I did really well with my stem cell collection and I got four times the amount. And that's true, except that in fact we're counting the wrong cells, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, we know that we've got enough cells to do transplant. So that's what we do. So it's much less invasive than doing a bone marrow harvest. And this is a real significant benefit. People's blood cell counts tend to recover much faster when we give them peripherally collected stem cells versus bone marrow harvest stem cells. That means fewer days of low immune system, lower chances of infection. So it's been streamlined. So the basic principle of autotransplant hasn't changed for 20 years, but the, uh, we've streamlined the process so that uh, it's, it's less arduous to go through now. So before people get their autotransplant, they've gone through everything. I often tell people, you know, this is coming in for your transplant. That's just a tiny little blip in the bigger picture of your treatment. You had your diagnosis, you had your induction therapy. Nowadays we use Cyborg D. In the old days they had VAD or sometimes just high dose decadron. Um, Cyborg D is the one that most people are familiar with now, the cyclophosphamide, bortezomib or Velcade, decadron, steroid, that combination. Some combination, it just differs depending on uh, you know, what country you go to, but the principle's the same. A combination of drugs that pull that myeloma under control and get people into as good shape as possible to go on to the, the, the big step, the high dose chemotherapy step. So they get that induction therapy, then they get their cells collected. We took, everyone goes through that mobilization process where we, we, we encourage more of the cells to go into the bloodstream where we can nab them with the apheresis machine. And we preserve those cells in dimethyl sulfoxide in these fancy high-tech freezers. So that's the high technology part. That's the part where people go, wow, isn't it amazing what we can do nowadays? And that's, it's amazing, I guess, because we've got apheresis machines and we've got liquid nitrogen vapor freezers and that's the high technology. But the principle is really straightforward. It's really simple. Collect those cells in advance, then give them high-dose chemotherapy, and then give them those cells back. It's not rocket science. <clears throat> so this Hickman line seems like a pain when you're getting it in, but it's your best, whoops, I guess I gotta master the art of this thing. Uh, it seems like a, a pain when you're getting it in, but it's your best friend during a transplant. Uh, because it uh, saves you about 250 needle pokes because all your blood tests done from it and medications through it. And it's wonderful when you're an inpatient. 
<clears throat> or just even an outpatient getting an auto transplant. So the actual auto transplant, that's the little part. Right? So you're getting, yeah, you get some hydration, you get some chemotherapy, uh, and then let that wash out of your system, get some stem cells infused, and then it's just kind of hanging out, supportive care, your counts are going to go low from the chemotherapy, and then they're going to recover. And that's, we call that count recovery and graftment. That's the medical term for it. The actual stem cell infusion is so anticlimactic. People have geared themselves up for something big. They've already had the big stuff. They had the diagnosis. They had to contend with that. They had to, you know, grapple with that new information. They had to get their, uh, you know, had to get all through their induction therapy. Had to get their stem cell mobilization and all that stuff. Had to sit there waiting to come into hospital. Finally, they come and it's like, well, what's this? It's just an intravenous infusion of your own stem cells. It's like, it's so easy, it can be administered by a cartoon character with no facial features. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, it's really nothing to it. So, yes, there's a bad taste and smell because there's this preservative, dimethyl sulfoxide, and it has this taste and smell sort of like cream corn. And even though it's going intravenously, from inside you get that funny taste and smell. If you spill in the lab dimethyl sulfoxide on your skin, you can taste it because it's just, so this volatile stuff goes right through your system. But it's not toxic. So it gives you a funny feeling, but that goes away right afterwards, as soon as the stem cell infusion is done. It hasn't, doesn't have any long-term toxicity. And it's done its job. It kept those cells alive while you froze them and while you thawed them out. <clears throat> so everyone has a calendar. Um, many people remember that. They have a calendar, which gives them a bird's-eye view of that stay, to try to demystify it, to try to show you that this is, this is not forever. This is a very finite experience. People come in with so much trepidation, so much worries, like fear of the unknown. When you convert the unknown into the known, it's like, oh, I can do that. Yeah. So the numbering system by convention is stem cell days called day zero, which inappropriately focuses people on their stem cells like that's the treatment, when in fact the high-dose chemotherapy is the treatment. But yeah, you've got to give stem cells afterwards. So melphalan is such a short-acting drug, you, give it, you can give the stem cells the next day, the melphalan has gone out of your system. So you want to plant those new seeds as soon as possible. You don't want to wait. Uh, so, so as soon as that melphalan has gone, get those stem cells in. So uh, for outpatients, we're giving the melphalan on day minus two. No, no good reason. Uh, it's, simply, it's simply because, uh, you know, people are coming from home. If, there, if there's any delays or some... As their chemo is given later in the day, we still want to have a good, good enough time between it and the stem cells. So for the outpatient program, we've just, just ch chosen to give the melphalan on day minus two. But for inpatients, we're still giving it day minus one because they're a captive audience. <clears throat> um, and like any chemotherapy, it's a week later that you're going to see the effects. Uh, so you're kind of hanging out the first little while, but a week later, Mucositis is that medical word for inflamed mucosa. So it's nothing to do with mucus or phlegm. Inflammation of the lining of your mouth, which is called the mucosa, is mucositis. So that's the irritation from the chemo. And of course, the blood cell counts go low. Neutropenia, meaning, penia means low. Low neutrophils, these are the, the, the cells of your immune system. They're low from chemotherapy. So you're vulnerable from around there, day six to about day 12. Um, and because, because of that, fevers can occur. Bacteria that are part of your system can cause fevers. Uh, we always deal with that with antibiotics if we need to. And then you start to get better from day 10. So that's when the healing process begins and the cells are starting to take, you're starting to recover from chemotherapy. As a parting shot, the hair falls out temporarily, except for people like me. So the hair falls out and then it'll grow back. Um, and then by day 12, you know you're well into the recovery period. You can sense it. I'm feeling better. My mouth's feeling better. My counts are coming up. Oh, yeah. He's, he wasn't lying to me. I'm actually getting better. <laughs> and then, and then by day, the average day for going home is day 14. Just an average. Some people sooner, some people later. But that's the typical stay. Some people maybe some complications, keeps them a little longer, an infection. Don't make, we don't send them home until they're good. So that's what we do. And people often tell me, oh, you know, especially at this part, day seven, day eight, they're at the little bottom, and they're going, this feels awful. Why did I sign up for this? Doc, what are you doing to me? Is this going to go on forever? And you've told them all this, and they st but you still feel like it's going on forever. And the reason is, that's because you're human. And we're programmed as human beings to feel bad when things like this happen, and there's a survival advantage to that. We evolved as a species to feel like crap when this kind of stuff happens. And that tells us that's bad, 
bad thing, poison, go away. We run away and we save ourselves and therefore we procreate and have children and we have other children who also hate bad things. And that's a survival thing. So it's normal, it's human on day seven and eight to go, what the hell did I sign up for? <clears throat> Intellectually, you know it's temporary and you're gonna get big gain from it and you're gonna get better from it, but you're actually programmed emotionally to feel bad at that point and to think, I shouldn't be doing this. Uh, but when you put it in perspective, I mean, this is really what you're doing. This is, everyone's heard the gardening analogy usually by now, right? I, I, I guess become legend, I think. <laughs> I started this, I don't know, some 15 years ago. Um, but uh, so if you consider that initially, there's the weeds, that's your myeloma, right? On the background of your, of your normal marrow. Uh, and then we just blanket with chemotherapy, blanket, weed killer. Weed killer, non-specific stuff. It's going to knock out stuff. As soon as that weed killer's done, we want to plant some seeds in the ground on day zero. That's your stem cells. By day six, yeah, we're seeing dead parts in your lawn. We're going to have holes because the weeds are, are gone. And you're feeling a little under the weather. And you're thinking, ah, oh, when's this going to get better? Well, lo and behold, day 12, you got no weeds. And your stem cells are kicked in. And you got through it. And you go, yeah, I've done it. He was right. <laughs> okay. and, and you put it in pr as a perspective. You know, this, this, this is to, just a, an example. Say this is a life... Oh, man. Let's do this. Okay. So you're, say this represents a lifetime, um, this pie. And, you know, the, the large portion of it is the time without the diagnosis of myeloma. And this, let's say that this purple part represents the time of your life not working. This went off. Working? Okay. <clears throat> so uh, this represents the time of your life that's spent with the diagnosis of myeloma. Though the blue piece of pie is the t proportion of your life spent getting your auto transplant. And people look at that and go, what, 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 what blue piece of pie? Well, there it is. There's the little piece of pie. That's the amount of time you spend in hospital getting your auto transplant. It's a tiny little sliver with an enormous gain afterwards. So that's worth it. So the people are going like, ah, you know, I don't really want to do this. I don't know. It sounds bad. That's because you're human. That's why you're asking those questions. Our job is to make sure you understand what you're going to get from it and how short that time is. And that's what makes it all worthwhile. So where do we go from here? With the outpatient transplants I mentioned, we started up our program at the beginning of the year, thanks largely to Christine Chen, Dr. Christine Chen, who's the head of our myeloma part. Actually, they, they had, um, Donna Reese is the head of our myeloma program. She's the head of our autologous stem cell transplant program. So uh, as everyone who's knows is on a waiting list, waiting lists suck because you never know when you're going to come in and how long is this waiting list. <clears throat> so out transpl outpatient transplants allow us to shorten the waiting list. And it's great. Um, it doesn't really make it any less crummy, objectively speaking. Chemotherapy is chemotherapy. Side effects are side effects. The time course is the same. Psychologically, there's no doubt that some people find it better. Even though they're going through the same crud, it's their crud. They have ownership of it because they're at home, they're coming back and forth, saying, reporting their symptoms, they're sleeping in their own bed, and they, they have this sense of control that they like. Not for everybody. I mean, some people's personalities are, look after me, wake me up when it's all done. <clears throat> And that person feels more comfortable in a hospital setting. Reality is the treatment's going to get through. There's, there's the con there's, there's not going to be any more or less complications doing it as an outpatient or an inpatient. Psychologically, some people find the outpatient thing a lot better. Other people don't. But it's certainly doable, just as doable as an inpatient transplant, as long as people are living near to the hospital so they can get back and forth easily. They got someone who lives with them that can drive them all the time. And that they don't have any other significant medical problems. If someone's higher risk, you know, they're a dialysis patient, they got heart problems, and that sort of thing, then we obviously prefer to keep them around. But outpatient transplants, there's a lot of literature on it now. It's just as, it's not, not, not more dangerous than an inpatient. It's just gotta be structured properly. Um, and in Toronto, it's a bit of a challenge because uh, it's not everyone lives that close. So, and traffic issues and so on. So, but outpatient transplants, we're doing more and more of them, and that keeps our waiting list down. So that's good. Targeted therapies, everyone, that's what all your other talks are generally about. That's the future of myeloma. So 
Right now, targeted therapies are limited in their success. They help. They help control the disease, and they're used in conjunction with autotransplant. They're used before and afterwards, using bortezomib before, using Revlimid afterwards. Um, so, and there'll be new drugs coming down the pipeline, no doubt, over the years, and, and they'll be incorporated into this algorithm. You need a darn good new miracle targeted therapy to make autotransplant obsolete. And that's, of course, what we want for the future. But I'm not holding my breath because, remember, 1983 to 1996, it takes time to find an effective drug. And to find really effective drugs and multiple effective drugs, it takes time. So we should be realistic that this is here to stay for a while. Let's make the most of it. Uh, let's get what we can out of this treatment. It's the most effective treatment still to control the disease in conjunction with the others. So really, that's what we do. Supercharger. Let's give people another lap. That's it. Uh, is there generally a uh, most critical point during the preliminary specific transplant process where you run a susceptible infection? Is there a, typically a point where you start to become defensive against the normal types of infections around your house, that sort of thing? <clears throat> yeah, uh, I mean, the, the, most of the time we relate it to when the neutrophils are low. So if, if you remember that uh, slide way at the beginning um, showing the different kinds of uh, blood cells, um, uh, here we go. Um, so, you know, these constituents of our blood here, the, the neutrophils are the main soldiers for fighting bacteria, <clears throat> and they're kind of an indicator of the health of your immune system when you give people chemotherapy. So when your neutrophil count goes low, we say, oh yeah, you're, you're vulnerable to infection, and when your neutrophil count recovers, um, then we go, okay, good, your immune system's back. Which is a bit of an oversimplification because there are these other cells of your immune system too, but in generally it's a good indicator. So with autotransplant, you're, specifically for myeloma, the white blood cell count is typically low around day six, uh, and then it starts to rise anytime after day 10. So generally a good five days, five, six days of low counts, low immune system, during which you're more vulnerable to, inf to, to significant infections, or bacterial infections. We use preventative antibiotics. So people are on antibiotics preventatively they're on, uh, and antivirals. So they're on ciprofloxacin to prevent bacteria stuff. They're on fluconazole to prevent yeast infections. They're on um, acyclovir to prevent uh, uh, exacerbations of herpes, so people cold sores in the mouth and that sort of thing. Um, and prevention of shingles, but you very rarely see shingles during an auto transplant anyway. Uh, but uh, so they're on preventative medications, but even so, when the counts are low, bacteria that, it's, you know, when the cat's away, the mice will play. So bacteria that are part of your normal flora that normally sit there in, in balance with your system can take advantage of that and cause fevers. And so a good 80 to 90% of people will still get fevers. Doesn't mean they're really any particularly worse off for it, but um, you know, we just have a routine for it, we do our cultures, and then we do the intravenous antibiotics until our counts recover. So a good 70 to 80 percent, sometime during that five or six days, will, um, will develop fevers and be on intravenous antibiotics. A smaller number are people who get more significant infections, so whether it's a pneumonia or something like that. Um, and, and the vast majority of those uh, also just get better, right? So we, we treat them, things get better, the counts recover, immune system, shake it off and so on. Every year there, there are, there's significant morbidity potential, not like with allo transplants where there's a donor transplant, but with auto transplant too, in any situation where you're taking someone's immune system and suppressing it that significantly, there's risk of life-threatening infections. The risk is very low, but there's still, we report, we tell people, every, everyone, that there's a one to one and a half percent chance of actually dying from an auto transplant. That's, as a group, and the people who actually do tend to run into problems are kind of, uh, you kind of know there's an issue at the beginning. They're generally quite frail to begin with, have multiple medical problems, um, and have a considerable history of frequent infections, and they're more vulnerable uh, people who end up maybe having complications that require the ICU and so on. Um, the, but there are also people like that who do fine. 
right? So, but those are the, generally the group that create that statistic for the whole population as a whole. So if you have, you know, a 54-year-old, no other significant medical problems, we're not really anticipating that sort of a complication. Um, people with, um, for example, an IgA kappa have a better prognosis than people with an IgA lambda, and I'm wondering why when they go through the same process. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> prognostic indicators are, are, uh, is, is an area of great interest and, and also fraught with uh, difficulty in interpretation. Um, so the IgA, and whether IgG or IgA, that whole thing has been more or less abandoned because it wasn't an independent risk factor. The, the people who feel the cytogenetics are a more specific indicator. So what kind of chromosomal and DNA mutation has occurred that creates this myeloma cell. Some are more aggressive than others. So even though we call them all myeloma, there's a huge diversity of biology within that, that, that name. So, um, so the, it may be that some more of people with IgA may have had a certain chromosomal abnormality, but just being IgA was not the, the issue. So we don't generally tend to think of IgA as worse than IgG and so on. Um, and neither with lambda or kappa. Uh, we think that those are kind of uh, missing the point that it's all to do with the, the chromosomal abnormalities, the genetic abnormalities. And that is an area where they're getting more information, but <clears throat> still not something you can hang your hat on. So yes, people get all nervous about what's called the 17P deletion, because uh, we know that that's a bad kind of genetic abnormality that tends to mean, on average, earlier relapse, shorter survival. But when I say, when you, as soon as you hear the word average and statistic, a flag has to go up, and you know, a little bell in your head has to go, well, that's very interesting, but how does that apply to me? Uh, because statistics were never meant to predict an individual's future. These are populations of people. So sure, population of people with 17P deletion, compare that survival to a population of people without the 17P deletion, the average is worse. But that doesn't tell you anything about an individual in that group versus an individual in this group. You could have a person who does better with 17P and a person without 17P who does worse. And then you go, if you just took those two people, you go, well, how come this one's way better? It's got 17P, they're doing way better than this person. It's because that's the way statistics are, they're averages. So they're interesting for the purposes of researchers who are looking for different approaches to treatment. They say, okay, if this 17P group on average is not doing as well with treatment A, maybe we need a better treatment, a different approach for these, this group. So we, that's why you do that. You know, why you look for a different treatment for, for, for those people to see if that could actually improve their average statistics. But people should never be going, oh, 17P deletion, that's it. I'm just, you know, not going to go traveling anymore and I'm not going to, because I'm just going to, you know, you got you to gotta grasp your life with two hands. You got to take the treatment, the best treatment available, grasp your life with two hands and live your life. And don't let the statistics get you down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Frank, do they ever do three stem cells? Yeah. We have uh, maybe three, uh, three or four. Uh, not three or four transplants, three or four patients over the last, uh, you know, 20 years. Um, <clears throat> so it's very rare. Uh, we know that second transplants, again, averages, statistics, uh, but on average, the duration of benefit for the second transplant is about half that of the first. Um, and the concern, of course, is the potential that the third one would be even less than that. But there's probably an outlier exception to that, and th these are the odd patient, like, no most noticeably, these were young people, you know, someone in their 30s, maybe, gets myeloma, has a fabulous response to the first treatment, goes a number of years, starts to progress, gets a second one, does a fabulous response, and goes for many years, and you think, okay, well, that's the kind of can't, because they're still young enough and healthy enough to undergo the rigors of the treatment, um, and they've got that pretty good statistic. Um, we don't do second transplants at all, second transplants, on people who relapse within two years of their first. Because, you know, it's a lot to go through with a recovery period. You want to have, the, you want to have some guarantee that you're going to get some bang for your buck. And, uh, and I don't mean that monetarily speaking. I mean, you want to have some quality of life for the, the hardship you go through. And if someone relapses six months after an auto transplant, 
and they're thinking theoretically they could get another three months from another transplant. They're going to spend that three months trying to recover from their chemotherapy when they should be you know, going to Bermuda. So that's, that's, uh, so, it's, so there are rare cases of doing the third transplant, but it's based on how, you know, their, their personal history. Yep. Oh, sorry. We'll come back. <laughs> no, go ahead. So as a, as a follow-up to, to the question that she just asked, what about those getting a tandem transplant? Yeah. Might there be a benefit in having, in, this case, in that case, a third transplant down the road that could be several years away? Yeah. Yeah, so in that, the, that we have done, yeah, well, some, so one of the people we did was they had a tandem transplant up front because the reasons for doing a tandem transplant have changed over the years. Because you know, we know that if you do a treatment, you get a certain degree of suppression. Hey, so everyone was interested about doing two, two back-to-back -back treatments. Maybe we get double the effect. That would be good. So there was interest in that. Um, and a lot of different centers doing it and trying it. And the problem is... Uh, figuring out who's going to benefit from that because it's double the toxicity too and you really want to go through that if you don't have to. So initially the thought was, <clears throat> well, let's do that for people who are young. And there was no good reason for it. The idea was, oh, they're young, they're strong, they can handle it, two transplants, maybe they'll get more benefit. And so we used to just, someone who's in their 30s, just get a tandem transplant. We don't do that anymore because we, found, we know from the statistics again that it didn't seem to make any difference because the other tandem transplant literature showed that whether you do a two transplants up front or one transplant, wait, live their lives, oh, starting to progress, do a second transplant. That, if you do that approach, it's just as good. So why do double toxicity up front when you've got some living to, live, to do and you, you don't want to slow down the recovery and it's resource intensive? So tandem transplants have generally fallen out of favor except for the discussion of the person with 17P deletion. Uh, so people where we get concerned that the, they're gonna relapse within that two year window. Because if they relapse within the two year window, they don't get a second transplant. And for people who have really aggressive myeloma, and the only indicator we have of that is, is kind of how they presented in the first place and, and, this, and these cytogenetics, as limited as they are. But if we're concerned that they're going to relapse within two years of their first transplant, those are the people we're now thinking they sh we should offer them double transplant because if they're healthy right now, let's give them the two transplants, give them the, you know, because if we wait and they relapse a year and a half from now, they're not going to be able to get their second transplant. So if this, if this gives them a little bit longer at the end, let's do that. So that's what they're doing. And, and that'll become obsolete, hopefully, when they find a more effective treatment for those aggressive myeloma patients. Sorry, so then my question was, for my wife is about to have a tandem transplant. Mm -hmm. for, to, why not store and uh, collect enough stem cells for a third transplant several years down the road? Yeah. Similar to someone because, one because the only time we do a third transplant is when people have gone years with good response. And, and they're otherwise well. Those people can easily be mobilized and collected again later. So you don't have to collect for three up front. Collect for two. If, if they're going to be a candidate for a third transplant, it means that they've been so well in the interim that by that point they'll have a good enough recovery of their marrow that we can do another stem cell collection. And that's pretty rare. We've likely done like less than one, less than you can count on one hand in 20 years, third transplants. This doesn't come up that often. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I was wondering uh, why there are age limits imposed on stem cell transplants, yeah. given the fact the person is in otherwise good health. Yeah, uh, and, and that's a good question. And that's a health policy decision made by different groups and different centers. Um, so tr traditionally, we have not had an age limit. Uh, for myeloma, we've had a functional limit in the sense that if somebody was deemed to be a little too infirm or significant, because that's where you run into problems, right? Those people that are going to, we don't want to kill anybody with the treatment. And, if, and we worry that when people are infirm that we're going to do harm rather than good. You're right, though. That's not based on age. It should be based on their whole clinical picture and their activity and so forth. And so traditionally, we have included people over age 70, up to age 75, um, as you start getting into the higher ranges, you start to get on shaky ground in terms of the literature. Um, you know, like there's case reports of people in their 80s being done, but you don't have good data to say that 
It should offer that to all people in their 80s. So uh, I think the oldest we've done is 74. We've done several 74-year-olds. More recently, there've been everybody's been uh, almost like in a war zone, panicking about resources, <clears throat> beds, waiting lists, difficulty in getting people in for their auto transplant. Hence, the big move for the outpatient program to take the pressure off that. Um, and during that time, there was some talk about hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing people over age 70 because of the fact that you know the literature is so divided on this. Um, but I'm not aware, and I'm better person to ask is the myeloma group, uh, the, you know, Dr. Tiedemann and Dr. Reese, Dr. Reese is particularly the head of the program. Uh, I'm not sure right now if they have anything on the books in terms of age limitation at Princess Margaret. Um, I know we've done people over age 70. Because uh, I have been told uh, some institutions that a 65 year kind of limit after that, I guess they consider people wouldn't be good candidates. Every set 70 years. <laughs> And then I guess it would have to be a very special situation where you would be looking at a 74-year-old, for example, as you did. I think uh, as we move toward more individualized uh, medical treatment, we would want to look at individual cases rather than have this kind of blanket determination that at age 65 or at age 70, you're not going to be eligible. Absolutely. We don't have that blanket arrangement at Princess Margaret. I, I should say, qualify that and say for myeloma. For lymphoma, there's a fairly good literature that was a really much higher mortality rate. And so for a long time, we had an age limit of 65. Then we started getting cocky thinking, you know, we're doing awfully well. Our patients are really doing marvelously. <laughs> so we started extending that up to 69. Um, and we're doing it but we sweat because it is definitely harder. We've, we're seeing that. And so there, there's, there, you know, for, depending on the diagnosis um, and the kind of treatments that are involved in those patients before they even get to auto transplant, uh, it can be pretty arduous for, for the elderly. But for myeloma, we haven't traditionally at our center had that cap. Other centers make their own decisions and often it's resource-based um, as opposed to, you know, some universal standard. One, one follow-up question: If uh, using your analogy about uh, blood stem cell transplants is kickstarting the body's uh, what uh, whole systemic health, um, if a person does not have this treatment, uh, what is the uh, reduction in their chance of uh, living? Um, a certain uh, quality of life type uh, existence without a stem cell transplant? Well, I think everybody will have some amount of quality life post-diagnosis of myeloma. The question is what can they do to maximize that, to increase as much as possible that amount of time. So if you don't do an auto transplant, you could still have very good quality life still in front of you. You don't know how long, as you don't know with or without a transplant how long. All we know is that Statistics, again, show us that uh, on, on average, we see a doubling of median survival for people who get an auto transplant. This is obviously, not, it's not, that's an average. So we could have a person who gets an auto transplant who relapses within six months, and you could have a person who doesn't have a transplant who's fine 10 years later because of the variability in the biology of this disease. But on average, yeah, it doubles the median survival, and that's why if somebody is otherwise hale and hearty, and going through this procedure is not going to adversely affect them in the, in the long term, then they'd rather do that and maximize their chances of, of having increased time, quality time in front of them. You. You're welcome. Hi, um, I'm one of the people who benefited from your very good here um, at Princess Margaret uh, in, the, in the transplant unit. And I'm very concerned actually about the outpatient program, uh, mm -hmm. about the inpatient program is. Um, even having discussions with you um, in the hospital. Um, but I wonder if you could talk about the risk factors associated with the outpatient program. And I understand the resource need for it, but, but the risk factors associated with the program. Yeah, I mean, Princess Margaret and Torontonians in, in general are pretty conservative <laughs> in the sense that we don't tend to uh, forge new territory aside from the Mavericks you know, like Tilla McCullough discovering stem cells and Burke Sagel pioneering Melphalan and so forth. But for the most part now, we tend to adopt evidence-based 
treatment options that are developed elsewhere. So we are by no means innovators uh, or forging new territory with outpatient autotransplant. We sat back and waited for others to prove that it could be done safely, done without any adverse effect on, on mortality, and so on. <clears throat> so, and then we said, okay, everybody else is doing it. They've got those numbers, no increased mortality. We've got these resources issues. It's time for us to now start to do what other centers are doing. Um, so it's not like we're thinking, oh, you know, we've got to do it because these are the resources. Let's see how it goes. And if, if our mortality is really high, then we'll abandon it. No, we're, we're only going into something with, you know, confident that we're not going to adversely affect mortality. Um, so that's the first thing. We, and, and Chris Chen is particular. I mean, I, like, I personally do inpatient care, and I like doing inpatient care, and I like the control that comes with inpatient care, and I like the relationship I have with my patients during their inpatient care, be able to talk with them each day and answer all their questions. I value that relationship, and I value the quality of care. And I was concerned. Oh, patients, you know, they're not going to get all of this. They're, you know, they're going to be on their own. <clears throat> but, um, but I can't argue with the facts that people are going through outpatient autotransplants and doing just fine. They may not benefit from their interpersonal relationship with me, <laughs> but, but in the big picture, they're, they're doing fine. Uh, the key thing, though, or what we've always felt, is patient selection. We don't want to do, we don't do everybody as out there. are places that do. In Vancouver, lymphoma, myeloma, all comers, outpatient. That's it. That's the way their program's set up. Take it or leave it. And they have no choice. We haven't adopted that approach. We, we, do, we only do select patients who meet criteria, you know, who live close enough, they've got the caregiver, um, they've, uh, got, you know, we, we provide parking passes, uh, you know, that's, so there's not undue expense involved in the procedure. They're coming every day. We're hydrating them, checking their blood work every day. Um, and then if they run into problems, if there's a fever, they're admitted. And they don't go to an emergency department, they come to us. They call in, oh yeah, we got a flex bed, you come straight to the ward. So there's so many uh, uh, precautions we've taken to make sure that we don't adversely affect our safety statistics with autotransplant. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you for your presentation. We've heard a lot about the process of um, just stem cell transplant. What I wonder is if you can summarize the benefit. We've seen like the track and looked at that, but I know it's a statistic. <laughs> question, yeah. I'm not going to rely on that for individual <coughs> prognosis, but I'm just wondering what is the compelling benefit because I've gotten a bunch of different pieces and I'm making inferences. I want to know your opinion on hard facts on the benefit. Yeah, it's, well, it's what I said before, the fact that it originally in 1996, the, uh, the, 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 the data that was emerging from this French study and from ultimate studies is that median survival was doubled. So, Again, it's statistics. So you're right that probably we do auto transplants on somebody who might do well without a transplant, but we won't know. We wouldn't know that. No way of knowing. And uh, if we didn't do it, and we failed the uh, missed the opportunity to double their median survival, their 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 average survival, then then we're going darn. <clears throat> so and we'd be we'd suffer a hell of a lot more angst with that decision if our treatment was more toxic. And that's where you get into things like, for example, allogeneic transplant. Allogeneic transplant kills 20% of people right off the bat with your treatment. They go in through this potentially bad, miserable graft-versus-host disease, bad quality of life afterwards. Some people, they're poster childs for allotransplant who do remarkably well, but those are the few. Um, but in general, it's a gruesome treatment to go through. If, if autotransplant was gruesome, we'd be agonizing over, you know, do we really want to do this? But if we got a treatment that takes two and a half weeks in hospital, and yeah, they're tired afterwards, but they're gonna build up quickly over the next couple of months, and that's very doable, and the risk of dying from this procedure is far less than the risk of having bypass surgery or any kind of major surgery, then this medical treatment makes sense. So when you weigh the benefits against the risks, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, but for allotransplant, it's a big deal. When you say double the media, Doubling the survival. Right. Yeah. Is that individual or on the population? That's on the population. Yeah, I mean, you, can, you, you, you hope it implies to the individual. In fact, some individuals don't get that kind of thing, a benefit, and others, 
they're going 15 years and they're having no problems. They're thinking, wow, that was really good. Now, part of that is just the biology of their disease. They had a more indolent form of disease, but probably that treatment has also helped them. Um, so there are no completely 100% guarantees in anything medical. It's, often, it's always based on statistics in the end. Um, but, but there's no question, especially you see it, it's, it's kind of especially apparent in, a, in people who get a second transplant, right? Because if you have a person who gets a first transplant, they go six, seven years, they say, wow, that was, you know, I've been feeling good, I've been living my life. Hey, it's starting to progress. And then they come in and get their second transplant, pulls it right back into control, and they're going on. And you think, well, that was obviously the right thing to do for that people, that person. They really benefited from their first, they obviously benefited from their second. And it's not just based on the fact that they're you know, walking around and driving their cars and, and going down to Florida. It's also based on the fact that we could see their, their abnormal protein, their monoclonal protein went away so that in response to the treatment. So it's undoubtedly a good thing for people. That's helpful. That's what I wanted to know as much as survival time. It's what's the benefit in terms of disease progression or other things? Yeah. Right. Oh, 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 disease, yeah. Not only median survival, but also disease-free progression, progression-free survival. Yeah, yeah, progression-free survival is enhanced as well as overall survival. Yeah. As a follow-up to that, perhaps I could, for the, your dad, for example, how many people I met today are going to start a transplant shortly. I have a tandem transplant in Norway within six months of each other. Uh, so here we are seven years later, uh, and feeling good. Are there days when I'm not? Yeah, I'm tired. But, you know, right now, at this part of my life, and that's just a little piece of that pie, uh, I'm not even on commitment, which is fine by me. I, it's, uh, so, yeah, it works. We wouldn't do it if it didn't work. <laughs> I don't think we would do it. We wouldn't offer it if it didn't work. Because, like I say, we're not innovators. We're not, we're not doing something crazy and untried and just saying, let's put, let's put this out there. We're basing it on what's proven in literature. For no reason, this is not a question or just a point, if you can be the champion of this, but for people that are living, this, this is increasing life expectancy for patients, and so as it pushes up against barriers of population, we don't know how to respond to the treatment yet, whether they're 75 or 80 or whatever, it's now like coming to that curve too, right? Yeah, I mean, that's why people hesitate for the 75-year-old, because yeah. the... the the data was, right, so there's a fair amount of data showing feasibility of doing the treatment. They're showing, oh yeah, these people tolerate it just as well. And then there's also data showing, yeah, they do seem to be also getting a prolongation in life. So there is emerging data in, in the elderly. The problem is if their, inc if their mortality risk of the treatment is increased, then if you're one of those statistics, then you're always kicking yourself, going, you know, why, with family members kicking. Why did we? Why do we let them do that? We, ha in our hands, we haven't seen an age-related increased mortality from the treatment so much as a uh, illness-related increased mortality. If, you know, we kind of like I say, the people who have got a lot of medical problems, had a lot of hospitalizations with significant infections, and they're pretty feeble coming in the door. Those are the ones we most worry about. Uh, a robust 74-year-old who's hitting the golf greens. You know, I'm not that concerned about. Uh, I'm not. Sure, I haven't been keeping track of who's uh, this gentleman here. Yeah, uh, yeah I went through my uh, transplant in January, and I was one of the first people to have it as an outpatient. I can certainly vouch for the program. I thought it was very well organized, and I always felt uh, well taken care of. I was just wondering about the numbers, how many transplants they've been able to do this year compared to previous years? And uh, more than ever. Yeah, it has definitely impacted the waiting list. We've done more. And we've also had setbacks with the inpatient program because <clears throat> um, traditionally we have a combination of we have private rooms and we have semi-private rooms. Uh, and that's fine until something happens uh, in, the, in terms of a viral infection from the community getting in. So if a, if a visitor, well-meaning or whatever, or anybody happens to expose a patient to a respiratory virus, a cold virus, um, that's a big deal when you have a low, a low immune system. It's a big enough deal for that individual. They'll get over it, usually, but the infirm people, the kind of people that we purposely do as an inpatient, 
are more vulnerable population, and we don't really want them exposed to a respiratory virus. So what we've, had, what we've seen is semi-private rooms are bad for that. If, if someone gets a virus, the other one's got a virus. Someone gets a cold, the other's got a cold. Before you, even, before you can jump on it and separate them. So we switched to putting people, everybody, in private rooms for the inpatients because now we had the most vulnerable patients. All the good comers were put into the outpatient program. So we had the most vulnerable people. And as soon as parainfluenza comes and really rears its ugly head or uh, any other respiratory virus, it's bad news to have people in a semi-private. So that took away five beds. We went from 17-bed service to a 12-bed service. That would have been disastrous without an outpatient program. You know, reducing the number of transplants that we do by almost a third is just not tenable with our waiting list. Thank God the outpatient program is up and running and working well, and that allowed us to not only keep our numbers up, but actually increase the numbers. So our waiting list is good. What is the waiting list? Uh, well, Andrew Winter and Allison Mayo, our coordinators, were better on, in terms of that. Um, you know, I, I think it's probably in the order of a couple of weeks right now, but it's a moving target. It's also changes based on the individuals involved. So sometimes a person is pushed up on the waiting list, not based on the time they had their Hickman line in, but based on the aggressiveness of their disease presentation. So somebody whose disease initially showed up as a really aggressive disease everywhere, that was hard to get under control, that type of person gets bumped in front of a person who just, I don't know, fine time, just got their induction therapy, and they're just kind of waiting on the waiting list. So it's not, it's not first come, first serve, it's based on the clinical need. So, but even so, the waiting list is, is now under a month for everybody. Outpatient. Yeah, yeah, outpatient, yeah, I mean, outpatient should be even faster, theoretically. Uh, just, I, only, I only work in the inpatient sphere. Um, I mean, our nurse practitioners, uh, you, so you, met, you know, we had Paul and uh, Karen. Paul left us, <sighs> went to the radiology department. He's in the, been working in the basement now. <laughs> so so uh, Karen and then uh, Lee Ping is going to be starting up uh, tomorrow. So we have two nurse practitioners, and they're, they're basically running the outpatient area and, uh, and asking us for support. So doctors provide support for them. But they, they can give you all the nitty-gritty day-to-day functioning stuff there. <laughs> Uh, lady, right behind. Sure question again about the certification program. You said that after in general, eighty to ninety percent of people get a fever at some point during the transplant. Does that mean that eighty to ninety percent of the patient um, members at some point have to become inpatients? Yeah. So we started off really conservatively. And anyone who got a fever got admitted right off the bat. Um, and we did that for a few months, and we saw that these people were still doing fine. Yeah, they got a fever, everyone gets a fever, you got on IV antibiotics, fever go away, doing okay. Um, and so what we started doing now is we do the IV antibiotics as an outpatient. <clears throat> so with, it's an ambulatory infusion pump. So they come in, if they're otherwise well, yeah, I got a fever, do our cultures, start our intravenous antibiotics, observe patient stable. They go home, the ambulatory infusion pump that's given them their doses of their antibiotic, still come back the next day, come back every day. And so only if a person seems sicker, has some other issues, then we would admit them to hospital. So now it's less than 80% who are being admitted. Even when we did admit everybody, yeah, that means 80% ended up as an inpatient, but only for a few days versus 16 days. So it's still freed up beds. So it still allows us to do more transplants. <laughs> Uh, this gentleman. I'm a successful candidate uh, a year ago. Uh, I was on the 15th floor. Yeah, we moved down to the 14C. We started in 14C, moved to 15A, moved back down to 14C. Um, my question is following that. Is anybody following sort of the fatigue, the, the brain fly? I know it's not too much. Because yeah. um, I found that actually lasting longer than I thought it would. Mm -hmm. It is, I mean, the answer is no, unfortunately, and yes, it's a legitimate concern, um, because <clears throat> there's a, quite a, for years, there's been a growing literature on the long-term effects of high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell transplant. Um, and we used to have a long-term follow-up clinic, got cut for resource reasons, no manpower, no clinic space. Um, 
so that fell by the wayside. Back when Aaron Shimmer was running it in the early days, he put out a couple of publications about bone density, about um, uh, pulmonary function, about uh, uh, um, uh, hypotestosteronism, that kind of thing, these effects of, in people who've had high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell transplant. So these are very good questions, legitimate questions. Uh, for which we have very few answers other than to refer to the literature. We don't have that data on our patient population. Sorry, I'm talking. We don't have that data on our patient population, and it's simply a, a resource issue. Um, the great difficulty in interpreting the literature is the huge heterogeneity, lovely, what's a word we love, uh, the wide variability in the number, of, in the types of patients being considered in that data. So if you have a person with um, you know, who got triple high-dose chemotherapy with total body irradiation for three days for germ cell cancer uh, versus a person with, uh, you know, who gets topicide and melphalan for lymphoma versus a person who gets just melphalan for myeloma. These are very different experiences. Not only the transplant itself, but all the treatment that came before, you know, six courses of multi multiple antibiotic agents, uh, multiple chemotherapy agents before coming into autotransplant. So the, this huge variability in the patient experience makes it really hard to generalize about the long-term effects because it stands to reason that a lot of those regimens are a lot more toxic than single-dose melphalan for myeloma patients. So you, you take that literature a bit with a grain of salt. Plus there's no baseline. No baseline, yeah. And now Revlimid maintenance is pretty standard because, because of the statistics on prolonging duration of remission no statistics on quality of life, and we know that a lot of people feel crummy on Revlimid. You know, they just they yeah. feel really tired, and they have to reduce the dose. And so that and then you're going, oh, I'm tired. Is it because the Revlimid, or is it because I had high dose chemotherapy, or is it, or is, or is it because I just don't sleep well? You know, <laughs> it's like it's really hard to to know. One question about that is, is you individualize the treatment, but the studies take into account everyone. Yeah, yeah. So I you know people could fit in. It's the major challenge in everything to do with cancer treatment is patient, this, the, trying to apply statistics to the individual. You can't. So that's the trouble. I'm here, so look. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Can you uh, expand on that 17P factor? Or is that well, I think you need a myeloma specialist for that I'm, rather than an auto transplant inpatient doctor. Um, but just, just that, again, the statistics give a short, short median survival for it, but this is statistics. So statistics simply means by this, this amount of time, uh, by this amount of time post-diagnosis, half the people are no longer living and the other half are living. For how long? So, so the median survival it sounds bad if you say the median survival is a year and a half. That sounds terrible. But you have no idea where you... You know, if you live for six years, and then you were done a great disservice by somebody telling you you're only going to live for a year and a half. So statistics, they're a problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I had a question about the outpatients. Um, well, then I'll go after it. <laughs> I know you're in the hospital, like in the inpatient for two and a half weeks, but if you're outpatient, you have to go to the hospital every day for two and a half weeks? Yep. Some people like it, some people don't. Some people find it insuring. It's my daily day out. Like, oh, I can see, oh, see the other people. <laughs> you know how long you're in the hospital each day? Yeah, you're in the hospital generally about half a day because you, you come in, you get your blood test, they hook you up and give you a liter of fluid generally, just some hydration because people aren't drinking necessarily enough. Right. Um, and then I uh, say, so everything's good, off you go, go home. It's like six hours before? Uh, maybe four, I think. You know, I think it, so it's. And you know, the, whether it's good or bad, there's a television screen there. It drives me nuts, but I, think, <laughs> I guess because <laughs> it's one one serving the whole group. Um, yeah, but it's it's human contacts. Not everyone's cup of tea, uh, but like I say, it's so w true personalization of medical care would take into account patients' preferences. That's not, what, that's not what we really mean by personalization of cancer care, unfortunately. When we hear that jargon, it's mainly talking about how do we find special, you know, different agents to treat different people. Uh, true personalization would also take into account what do, they, what, do, what do patients really want. But there we've come up against the problem of resources. So, so that's why the decision to the, those who put the outpatient program in place was that the patients won't get to choose between inpatient or outpatient. 
It'll be based on objective criteria, whether it's safe to be done as an inpatient or an outpatient. So you don't choose, it's the doctor who chooses? Yeah, There's, the, the doctor doesn't even choose. There is a sheet of criteria, tick, 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 you're an inpatient. Tick, 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 you're an outpatient. Um, so your doctor doesn't even choose the, the criteria defined. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I have to go back here. I, okay. Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't, I meant, okay, I'm going to go over to Minera, and then I'm going to come back, and then I'm going to get you. I'm really lousy at this moderation stuff. I really, okay. I have a question about averages and statistics. So typically, when someone has had a, a transplant um, and Just require a second transplant, on average, how many years between the first and second transplant? Yeah, uh, sorry, I just realized for the first time that all the way along I was supposed to be saying the questions over again for the purpose of this, and I haven't been doing that. So we'll have to go back to the beginning and start all those questions over again. Uh, so the question was uh, um, the, the time between first transplant and second transplant, what's the average of that, dura of that time? I don't actually have that statistic. I don't, I don't know what the average is. I mean, I see people who have relapsed shortly after that two-year window, uh, and I've also done people 13 years later. So it's a range. Where the average is between that range, I, I don't know. Uh, and then come back to, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, again, I want to thank you for your time. And, um, my question, um, they, uh, they say that there is a very strong um, connection between the mind body uh, and, and uh, especially with cancer and uh, I know that resources are limited um, and uh, I was wondering if, if there is a possibility that they can develop a package for um, the patient to, to perhaps help them with the mind body connection to help healing and uh, uh, heal their cancer, uh, heal after the treatment, uh, etc. What's your uh, thought on that? Oh, I think that's bang on. I think there's definitely a connection. It's, it's completely arbitrary to think we can separate the mind and the body, right? I mean, we're, we're one organism, and one thing affects the other. Um, and just, the, just because we have a consciousness doesn't mean that that's separate and unrelated to our physical being. So absolutely, they've got to be related. You know, a person who has no morale, low morale, lies in bed, doesn't get up, doesn't clean themselves, doesn't have any hope for the future, is gonna do worse than a person with the same medical issues who goes, yeah, I'm getting up, I'm gonna take that shower, I'm gonna you know, interact with people, I'm gonna take some deep breaths. Um, your, your mind affects your body, at least it affects your activities, which may affect your body, but I think on a deeper level it probably does. I, I don't have data for that. But I, it's got to be. They've got to be one and the same. Uh, do we have a package to help with that? Things are better now than they were in the sense that we have, you know, the occupational department does relaxation therapy. I'm talking about the inpatient thing. Really, it should be across the whole spectrum, but I can only speak to the inpatient experience. Uh, I, and, and really, uh, we have the occupational therapy doing relaxation sessions. Some people like it, some people find it hooey, but for the people who like it, that's the point. Uh, you know, we don't, the people who find it hooey, that's fine, they're doing okay. <laughs> so, uh, so the person who likes those sessions, um, we have music therapy, uh, Sarah Rose uh, will actually come in and request you with her keyboard and she'll do music therapy with people. We don't have hands-on stuff, you know, massage therapy. I think that would be good. I think there's something to be said for that. Everyone gets all hyper about medical legal aspects of hands-on stuff, so it's not there. Um, so that's, uh, so, but we do allow people to bring in anything that they want from, you know, in terms of their support. So they can have somebody, a friend or family arrange something. But the hospital doesn't have a program of that sort. I'd like to just recommend Wellspring, though, you know, post-care uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, experiences or uh, supports, they're really excellent and it's all free. Are you, are you aware of Wellspring? Yes, okay. 
And I know the PMH also has the survivorship program, uh, which you know, I think mainly rose out of breast cancer, but I think it's extended beyond that. I'm not expert. I'm sad to say I'm not expert on that. I, I'm so focused on the inpatient section of people's care. I don't have a clinic. I don't see them afterwards. Um, so I, I can't adequately answer the question for pre and post support. <laughs> oh, but I will say one thing, which I, and that is, I think the single most important innovation to inpatient auto transplant care at Princess Margaret in the last 10 years was wireless internet. Because <laughs> it made a big difference. Oh, it's, you know, it's wonderful. Get rid of that sense of isolation. You're sitting here in a dark room all alone, stuck here, what am I doing? If you can Skype people, and not only people in Toronto, but people around the world, and you can get on there, you can watch movies, Man, that really helps in terms of quality of life. I <laughs> this on eBay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, is, it... is point zero at this point in time the limitations? Say it again. Point zero. In other words, for my level. Is that as far back as, as we know at this point that it starts, even though something is causing those mutations and we don't know what it is? Or, in, in other words, point zero from where we, one would know that myeloma is progressing or has started. Would it be with the genetic mutations? Uh, I mean, how do we detect when the disease is relapsing? No. No. When the disease starts. When the disease starts. Yeah, we can't do that currently. Um, that gets to um, something, a hot topic is what's called MRD, or min, min, minimal residual disease. Tests of minimal residual disease. How sensitive are the tests for myeloma to detect myeloma or to detect when it's relapsing? So most of the conversation is in the context of relapse. People have been diagnosed, they've had their treatment. We want to know how effective that treatment's been and, how, and when the disease is progressing. And those defini that definition has completely changed over the years, right? Because it used to be, when there was no real effective treatment for myeloma, it used to be called remission when the monoclonal protein was cut in half. What kind of a remission is that? It was an arbitrary definition because people didn't get better, treat better responses than that because there wasn't any effective treatment and we only had that test. And so for the purposes of studying and comparing statistics, we said, okay, a response that makes the protein dump in half, that was called a remission. That's obviously not a real remission. So that got changed over time to 90% drop in the protein. They called that a, a very good uh, partial remission. You know? So they're, then, then they said, when you don't detect the protein, all the treatments got better and you could actually get the protein down, then they say, oh, well now when we see no protein, that's a remission. But is it really remission? No. All it means is that test can only detect things up to that point. So the level of the disease is below what your test can detect. Then free light chain assay came along. It measures not only the whole, the whole antibody, but that little, that little short piece, the kappa or lambda. Much more sensitive. So people who had no sign of disease, you could still detect it on their kappa light chains. And they would say, oh, Okay, we gotta, now we have to say a new definition for remission is there's no, you can't detect that either. Or you could also argue we should do a bone marrow, make sure you don't see any plasma cells there and you have no free light chains. Okay, we'll call that remission. Now they've got even more sensitive tests that are coming down the pipeline that are going to be with us in the next two years that are supposed to be even more sensitive. So you can either on a bone marrow or in blood doing tests that detect the tiniest little amounts. And so that'll reset the definition of what is a remission. And then when the disease is coming up is when that test goes up. But will those tests ever be used for the diagnosis of myeloma? Probably not because their incidence 40 per million per year. Unless you got an incredibly cheap test that you can toss into an annual physical. Um, but most of these tests tend to be highly expensive, right, and specialized. So generally people find out they have myeloma once there's something awry. You know, their hemoglobin has dropped or the creatinine has risen or they've broken a bone. Uh, and then they go, wait a minute, calcium's high. What's going on? Then they get the test that leads to the diagnosis. To detect it before that as a screening test, I don't, I don't see that coming anytime soon. But does it, in other words, the point that we know where it starts from the beginning, is that with a genetic mutation? That, oh. That, that's 
Okay, I, so I answered the wrong question. Sorry about that. Erase all that. <laughs> there has to be a genetic mutation to cause myeloma. It doesn't necessarily have to be one that we can detect. Right? So we have a few ones that we test for that we know, and we say, yes, they have these abnormalities, but people can have myeloma and have what we call normal cytogenetics because it's something we don't have a test for. Right? So, so their myel when myeloma starts is not based on the test. It's some theoretical time that we can't detect, um, and it's not based on, and, but surely there is a genetic abnormality at the time a person has myeloma. The thing is also, it's not as simple as we think. It's not just one, uh, it could be several mutations that cumulatively cause the scales to tip, and then it becomes into the, comes clinically myeloma. And, and as, of course, you see that in the, the so-called MGUS patients, people who just have this abnormal protein and they're otherwise fine, and they're followed along and for 20 years and they're fine, don't have any problems. But a percentage of those will progress to develop myeloma. So at what point did their disease start? Did it start back when they had that protein or did it start when they mutated further and became sick with it? It's an arbitrary definition. <laughs> Is there any consideration either now or in the future of reducing the melphalan dose uh, prior to the transplant compared to the standard that's used? Yeah, I don't think anyone would reduce. Uh, I mean, we reduce when we need to because we don't think a person can live with a high dose. So uh, hemodialysis patients get worse toxicity from chemotherapy, uh, so we have to reduce it. We have to reduce it. So we reduce it not because we uh, want to, but because we have to. Uh, the concern, of course, is as you reduce the dose, you're going to get less effect. We know there are dose response curves to melphalan and to many drugs that the higher the dose, the better, more effective it is for the disease. So if you're talking about like if you combine it with novel therapies, maybe you can get away with a lower dose um, and maybe that'll be the truth. But I think what's going to more likely happen is they're going to wait till they have such better novel therapies that they can abandon nonspecific chemotherapy entirely. Because really, you want to do saturation bombing when you've got a sniper. Yeah. Part of my question you've already answered about going from the um, individual room to the semi. To yeah, it's a big, big, big topic of debate. Yeah, the first time I went in, which was 10 years ago, um, you couldn't bring any outside food in. Yeah. I was just wondering, like, what changed because when yeah. I went in this time, I opened up a semi mm -hmm. and could bring in anything you wanted. The food thing changed, and I'm glad it changed because hospital food is less than inspiring. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and, and people we take away their appetites too. And so when they have a hankering for something, the last thing we're going to do is say, oh, but you can't have that. It's like, it's like they haven't eaten anything, and they suddenly say, I really want watermelon. We're going to say, oh, okay, you can have anything but not watermelon. No, I mean, they're going to have whatever you want with common sense because we know from all the literature, people aren't getting sick from their food. Okay, that's right. Yeah, I mean, your, your body lives with massive amounts of bacteria in it, and whether you have a, you know, a bologna sandwich uh, or, <laughs> or a piece of watermelon or a salad makes no difference to that. What we're concerned about is not the stuff in food, we're worried about respiratory viruses for the most part. And gastrointestinal viruses, and yes, you can get gastrointestinal viruses from contaminated food, but it's kind of obvious whether your food is being brought in by somebody with dysentery or not. So, <laughs> so people know, they use common sense. Um, so the food is not the issue. The issue really is people with uh, sniffles, sneezes, coughs, or, and they say, oh, it's just allergies, don't worry about it. You know, I mean, sure, I mean, that person is well-meaning and they may really have allergies, but if they, they wouldn't know if they were just coming down with a cold and can't take any chances. So uh, we used to be more cavalier about that, but now that we have the most, like I say, the most vulnerable patients as inpatients, um, uh, the last thing we want is to have any lateral spread of respiratory viruses. So now we're so strict, I don't know whether this will be long-lasting, but we got hyper about it. We actually make visitors wear masks now. And it seems like a double standard because doctors and nurses don't need to wear masks, but the visitors do. And it's like, well, it's not that you're less honest than me, it's just that, you know, sometimes well-meaning people come in and they bring in a virus. Um, 
And, and then the next question that people usually have, if I can anticipate the next question, is, well, but the outpatients are going and mixing with the general public. Why come you're not worried about them? I'm not worried about them because they are the better players. They are the people who are not so infirm and not so vulnerable. Um, and if they get a cold, yes, it's a drag, but it's not a big deal. And a good thing is they're not bringing it into our ward and giving it to our collection of, of infirm patients. So I, I, you know, generally speaking, it's okay for somebody to have a cold if they're well enough to be an outpatient. <laughs> Hello. This is a matter of record, because I've already discussed this with you, but for second transplants, can you talk about the storage life of uh, frozen stem cells? We haven't seen any limit or degradation or fall off. So, you know, stuff has been thawed out after 12 years and it's been fine. Yeah, so. Or even beyond that. And if, if you say they weren't available, you can always, if you've got out, like my wife has been 12 years, you can still do a recollection. You can still do a recollection. Yeah. Most of the old products have what are called test uh, samples. So they got not only the product in the, in the bags, in the canisters, there's some little tubes. And so we can thaw out the tube and test the viability of the product in the tube so you know that this, the rest of the stuff's okay. <laughs> a couple other things were mentioned. You mentioned mucositis. Mucositis. Itis means inflammation, inflammation well, of the I, mucosa. I yeah, the, the was there, they recommended, a lot of people say take ice chips and everything. <clears throat> that was, that's been around for a long time, but they recommended in Princess Margaret a, a, a rinsing using um, salt, a salt a saline solution. Yeah, pretty high tech, eh? Well, water and salt. <laughs> for my wife, one of the nurses that had stated that usually, in her experience, the only patients that got most sores were leukemia patients who were usually younger younger patients who didn't like the taste, this is like yeah. 12 years ago, who didn't like the taste of the salt, so I'm not going to do that, and they wound up with mouth sores yeah. the next to stay in the hospital. I, I mean, apples and oranges, you can't compare a young leukemia patient, so a different regimen and everything. So well, certain, yeah, the bottom line is ice chips works. It doesn't work for other chemo regimens. It works for melphalan because melphalan is such a short-acting drug. If you suck on ice chips for an hour while the melphalan is being given, you're protecting the lining of your mouth from the melphalan because that melphalan goes in, poisons the cells, is rapidly cleared out of your system. So at the peak of activity, you've protected your mouth. If you gave someone a chemotherapy agent that hung around in their system for three days, suck on an ice chips for an hour isn't going to do anything. Uh, and then you can't suck on ice chips continuously for three days or your head would fall off. So you can't. So, so for melphalan, the ice chips is good. That's when we do the ice chips. The salt water is, is good for anybody. It's good for your mouth. Rinsing the mouth frequently with salt water is good for the pH and it keeps down the bacterial count. It doesn't necessarily prevent chemo-induced sores, but at least it doesn't exacerbate them. It, it prevents other things from exacerbating or worsening those sores. So that's a good thing. How long, like, after the injection of alpha one should you be sucking ice cubes? Or? Oh, one hour. Just one hour is kind of yeah. Is that what they tell patients yeah. now rather yeah. than the salt? Well, no, we do salt too. They, the, salt, the salt water rinses are throughout their stay. Okay. Uh, the ice chips are for one hour. And maybe a comment. I know my wife had a lot of problems with nausea, and uh, you, you threw almost everything, including I think it was Navinol, which was, isn't that the active ingredient of marijuana? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but, and the nausea is not that bad. I guess I should say it's not like you get watching the Terry Fox movie where he's just retching and having terrible, uh, you should talk about it. So, I mean, the thing about nausea is it's highly individual. Uh, and that's the whole mind-body thing too, because there's an enormous link. Um, <clears throat> people with higher anxiety levels have worse nausea. And that's not their failing, it's their biology, right? So, um, and so the medications address it from all sorts of different levels. Yeah, there's nausea centers in the brain, there's things that coat the stomach, and there's, uh, you know, th things like nabilone, which also help uh, with, with a general relaxation and Ativan even. So, yeah, we throw everything in the kitchen sink at some people who are the most vulnerable. Most people now with our anti-nausea regimen are doing just fine, uh, but for those, ex there will always be some with those extra challenges, and we'll get, pull out everything we got. Contrary. <laughs> I guess the point I want to make is that you can handle a lot of situations that patients may have, whether it's nausea or whatever, the infection. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the vast majority are like the calendar sheet said. Go through it, come out. Yeah. <laughs>